As a teacher at Colin Powell Elementary, I use stories to inform kids about the ancient world or the significance of the number zero. I also share classic stories like Charlotte's Web and Treasure Island. I tell stories, read stories, write stories, encourage students to create stories, but I'm not a storyteller. You see, there's a slight difference between telling stories and being a storyteller. And that's what we're going to learn about today. Long before words were inscribed in stone, on mammoth structures, or volcanic rock, people told stories to entertain themselves. It was a way of explaining and preserving the world around them. Storytellers of ancient Greece, China, India, Africa, the Americas, everywhere told stories to explore ideas of love, friendship, faith, betrayal, leadership, mischief, and so much more. Storytellers don't always tell the truth, but there's always truth in what they have to say. Teachers might call this the main message, the theme, or the moral of the story. Stay with us, there's a lot to cover. It's coming up next on Meet the Author, an author who just happens to be a very good storyteller. The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools, funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. MTA studio. I'm Suzanne Tweet, filling in for Della Kidd. Joining me today is master storyteller and author Rob Cleveland. He'll be sharing his ideas about the writing process, talking about his book, and telling a few stories. <laughs> Rob, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Suzanne. What a lovely day. I love the studio and all the plants and things, the little cartoon animals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I made you laugh. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Well, take one part wisdom, one part colorful characters from different corners of the world, toss them together, and you'll get a delightful mix of Rob's stories. Some of his book titles are How Tiger Got His Stripes, The Clever Monkey, The Magic Apple, The Clever Monkey Rides Again, and many more. Let's get started with an email from Evan at Johnsburg Elementary School in Pennsylvania. Okie doke. He writes, Hi, Mr. Cleveland. When did you decide to become a storyteller? Oh, well, hi, Evan, and a uh, good question. I've always loved stories, and at some point when I was in college, I decided to, to do theater, and theater sort of led, and theater is storytelling, and then that eventually led to theater, led to stand-up comedy, which led to storytelling, and so it was kind of a progression like that, and that brought me to, to where I am today, sitting in a lovely, comfy chair. <laughs> Well, Rob, now that we know a little bit about you, mm -hmm. how about a story? How about a story? You know, oh, look, there's, there's a little clever monkey, a folktale from West Africa. Why don't we do the clever monkey? <gasps> Let's go this way. We'll find the monkey says, <gasps> hello, students all around the world. Now, <clears throat> this is a story from West Africa called the clever monkey. In a jungle in West Africa, two cats found a large piece of cheese. Now, these cats could not believe their good fortune. They both loved cheese more than anything, and they were both very hungry. <clears throat> but they had a problem. There were how many cats? Two. How many pieces of cheese? One. Huh, no child left behind. They had a problem how to divide the cheese. The first cat said, I would be happy to divide the cheese into two equal pieces. <laughs> The second cat said, no, I will divide the cheese into two equal pieces. Mwahaha. Mwahaha. Listening to the two cats argue was a monkey. Now, the monkey also loved cheese. He swooped down between the two cats and said, my friends, I will be happy to divide the cheese for you into two equal pieces. The two cats agreed. 
and the monkey proceeded to divide the cheese into two equal pieces. All right, let me see. The hypotenuse on the, let's see, pi r square. Well, technically pi r round, but let's not quibble. All right, we are And he divided the cheese into two pieces and presented them to the cats. Here you are, my friends. Uh-oh. I did not do a very good job dividing. This piece is much bigger than this piece, but don't worry, I can make them the same size. The two cats agreed, and the monkey proceeded to nibble a little bit off of the bigger piece of cheese. And then, there, now they are the same size. Uh-oh. Oh, I nibbled too much. Now this piece is bigger, but don't worry, I can make them the same size. Again, the cats agreed. The monkey nibbled a little bit off of the other bigger piece of cheese. Uh-oh. I nibbled too much. Now this piece is bigger. Some of you can see where this story is going. Well, the cats still wanted the monkey to make the cheese the same size, and so he continued trying to make the cheese exactly the same size. Uh-oh. 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 Uh the monkey kept nibbling and nibbling. The cheese got smaller and smaller. The monkey's belly got bigger and bigger, and the two cats got more and more nervous. The monkey kept nibbling until finally there were only two tiny pieces of cheese left. Uh-oh. Uh-oh there. Now they are the same size. Here, enjoy your cheese, my friends. The monkey waddled off into the tree, leaving the two cats to stare sadly at their two tiny pieces of cheese. The first cat looked at his piece and looked at the second cat's piece, and the first cat said, your piece is bigger. The second cat looked at his piece and looked at the first cat's piece and said, it's not, your piece is bigger. The first cat said, it's not. Second cat said, is too. First cat said, is not. Second cat said, is too, is not, is too, is not, is too. For all we know, the two cats are still there arguing, and the clever monkey is still smiling. So it was told to me, so it was told to you. Bravo, Rob, that was terrific. Right now, we're going to take a few questions from students at my school, Colin Powell Elementary in Centerville, Virginia. They were very curious about Rob and his story. Here's what they wanted to know. The clever monkey, why did you have the cats still fighting at the end? Did you make up the archer and the sun, or did you rewrite a fable that you heard? How long have you been writing books? What inspired you to write the magic apple? Well, Rob, those are some great questions. Let's start with the first one. How long have you been writing books? Actually, I started putting my stories down in book form probably about four or five years ago when some friends and I decided to take these stories, these old classic stories, and do them both in print, well, in print, in an animated form, and as audio read-alongs. And so we started developing the Story Cove books, which are, now there are 22 titles, seven are mine, and then there are a number by uh, other storytellers. And so uh, that's when we started putting my stories down in uh, book form. Okay. Well, the next question was, did you write The Archer and the Sun, or did you rewrite a fable that you heard? Archer and the Sun is a, about a five, six hundred year old story from China. It is a double how and why story. It tells why the sun comes up in the morning and goes down, and why roosters crow. And so you get sort of like two, two, two tales in one. But it is a story that I heard, and I thought it was really, really a lot of fun. Well, the next question was, in The Clever Monkey, why did you have the cat still fighting at the end? Because the point of the story is that even after what they'd gone through and trying to find out, because The Clever Monkey is one of those kind of neat stories. There are a lot of lessons in these old folk tales. And The Clever Monkey at its root is about sharing. But I never say the word share. And usually kids can figure out, wow, if they'd really worked it out themselves, they could have had a lot of cheese. And the monkey ate everything. And now they're arguing, which means they really didn't quite get the point which means that the next time they find something, it's a pretty good shot that the monkey will go, oh, look, oh, you found a big piece of roast beef. Oh, let me divide that into two equal pieces. <laughs> and they'll go, okay. Oh, they didn't remember about the cheese. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes people, sometimes characters learn in stories, and sometimes it, it takes a little while, just like us. Sometimes we learn, and then sometimes it takes us a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> well, the last question was, what inspired you to write The Magic Apple? Magic Apple is a really, really neat story, and that was a great question. Who was that one from? That was from, um, that was from one of the small people that asked. Well, it was a great question. Uh, Magic Apple is a story from the Middle East. There is a 
There's a Hebrew version, there's a Muslim version, and it echoes a Christian parable. So I wanted to do that story because it's one of those tales that shows that we're, they're closer to each other than we are apart, that a lot of things, especially in stories, they unite us. So um, anyway, uh, that, that's why I picked the Magic Apple, because it was one of those that really kind of crosses a lot of different lines. Where do you usually get your ideas from in the How the Tiger Got His Stripes, for example? Um, Tiger, how Tiger Got His Stripes was came because I specifically looked for a story from Vietnam because most of what we know about Vietnam in this country is that it's, it's a place where there was a big war and lots of stuff got blown up. And a lot of people don't know that Vietnam is an incredibly old country with a really rich cultural and folklore history. And so I went and I found this story and thought, wow, this would be a really good one to animate. And it's actually the one that was one of our mo more popular story coves. And it's the one that made me an award-winning children's book author. I knew you were going to ask about it, Suzanne. I just jumped on it. I'm going to toot my own horn. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, but I did. Uh, How Tiger Got His Stripes won a uh, World Storytelling and uh, World Storytelling Honors Award for Young Listeners, which was really, really cool. So I won a, an award for a book from Vietnam, and I'm not Vietnamese. But uh, we're all connected, and so I am from Vietnam like several generations back. <laughs> it's okay, breathe, breathe. <laughs> well, in just a few minutes, mm -hmm. we're going to open up our phone line <gasps> so you can meet the author, Rob Cleveland. Oh, boy. Our number nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703-978-1636. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, more questions for our guest, author and master storyteller, Rob Cleveland. So now, right track. Writing tips for kids by kids. When writing in Folktale, remember to make sure your story solves a problem. This tip will help you stay on the right track. When writing Folktales, remember Folktales always have a moral and Folktales always have talking animals. These tips will help you stay on the right track. Rob, at the beginning of the show, mm -hmm. I mentioned that there was a difference between telling a story and being a storyteller. Can you explain what the difference is? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a real subtle difference. Um, everybody tells stories. Uh, you know, not, uh, some of us do it professionally and do it in front of large groups of people, but everybody at their root is a storyteller. I mean, everyone. If you've ever had to go to traffic court or if, you've, if any of your students <laughs> had ever, you had, they said, uh, Miss Tweet, uh, I know that my, I had my homework was ready to come, <laughs> but this is what happened, okay? You know about typhoons, <laughs> and, and the typhoon came, and see, that kid right there became a storyteller. And then, I mean, but we've all done it, and so it's really, it's a very big, it's a big part of our, our lives. I think everybody is a storyteller, but, you know, in telling a story, it's finding the little elements that make it a good presentation. Well, what elements do you look for in a good story? I look for uh, interesting, really fun characters. I look for a uh, variety of cultures. I don't like doing stories all from one, you know, I like doing stories from Africa and from Asia and from uh, the Middle East and from Latin America, um, from the Marshall I you know, Islands, you know, little places where you go, whoo, there's a fun story. And then I like doing stories that I can kind of do kind of fun voices with. And I also like stories that when you get done with the story, there's been a lesson that you that kind of kids got or that adults got without really being hit over the head with it. Like with, with, like with Clever Monkey, wow, that was a story about sharing. Wow, that's pretty cool. Or with Tiger, how Tiger got his stripes. It's like, wow, you know, wisdom is one of those things. You can't make somebody give you wisdom. You've got to find it yourself, which is the subtle message of how Tiger got his stripes. <laughs> but I'm not gonna tell you that story, so you'll have to go and find it yourself. <laughs> subtle plug, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> so. <coughs> What do you like about storytelling? Um, I like connecting with people. I like performing. Um, like I said, I started in theater, uh, stand-up comedy. Uh, and the thing I really love about storytelling is actually seeing the impact when, when people, when something in a story touches somebody and seeing kids go, oh, or, or adults that kind of look at each other and smiling. It's something that you don't get if you're doing stuff on film. I mean, film is fun, but you don't, 
get that impact. You have to go and sit in the movie theater and just like look at everybody's face and go, that was my scene. Did you see? How was that? I had a, okay, fine. But storytelling, you're, you're right there and you get some really, really great feedback. I was doing Clever Monkey once and this, this kid was looking at me before I started the story and he was frowning at me. It was at the, uh, it was a benefit for the International Rescue Committee for uh, families that have been displaced from their country and kid was from West Africa and and I said why are you frowning and he said oh, the clever monkey my grandfather used to tell that story I just don't want you to mess it up <laughs> so I'm going oh great there's no pressure now <laughs> and, but I told the clever monkey and the kids were laughing a good time and I finished the story he had not cracked a smile during the entire story I finished I looked at him and he smiles he said you did a good job and I said I said yes very fun, but I love connecting with people through stories, and I think it's a really great way to connect. Well, Rob, how about another story? <gasps> how about another story, Suzanne? Let's see, what shall we do? <gasps> we'll do a fable, why don't you? Now, Aesop was a storyteller. Um, he's very famous in Greece, but they're trying to figure out that Aesop was probably African, because a lot of his early stories are also African uh, folk tales as well. But here's one of Aesop's lesser known fables. It has a very well known moral. It is called The Ant and the Dove. Coo, coo. Now, all of you that are watching, when I say the ant, you do like that. When I say the dove, you go coo, coo. And when I say river, you go whoosh, whoosh. I can't see you, so we're going the honor system that you're actually doing it. So, the ant and the dove. Once, Mr. Ant uh -uh, was walking by the stores of a rushing river. Whoosh, whoosh, when Mr. Ant decided to look at his reflection in the rushing river, whoosh, whoosh, he bent over and looked and said, Woo! looking good and he looked in and he really liked how he looked so he bent over and bent over and bent over and he fell kaplunk right into the rushing river which started to rush mr ant ah, ah, away down the river and mr ant said oh this is the end of me all the humanity rosebud subtle reference ask your teacher and as he's being carried away by the rushing river miss dove woo, woo, up in her tree saw mr ant and the river and she snipped off a leaf, the leaf swirled down and landed right in the middle of the rushing river. <laughs> Mr. Ant was able to climb on the leaf and escape safe and sound from the rushing river. <laughs> Mr. Ant waved at Miss Dove, coo coo, and off they went. A couple of days later, Miss Dove coo, was sleeping <laughs> in her nest when a bird catcher ooh, was creeping up with a trap to capture Miss Dove coo, and to take her home and put her in dove soup. Now, Mr. Ant, saw the bird catcher and quickly crawled up the leg of the bird catcher and with his little ant jaws bit down and the bird catcher went <coughs> it woke up miss dove <coughs> and she flew away safe and sound she was saved by the ant who had been saved by the dove <coughs> and they had helped each other and the moral of this story of course remember one good turn deserves another from Aesop, the ant and the dove. So it was told to me. So it was told to you. And you did a wonderful job telling that story. Rob. Thank you, Suzette. <laughs> Students from Anniston Elementary School in Gwinnett County, Georgia, sent us a few questions on tape for Rob Cleveland. Let's look and listen. How long does it take you to write a story? What is the hard part about Growing a story. Do monkeys really eat cheese? Why does the monkey lie in both stories? Those are great questions, yeah, Rob. Absolutely. Help us with the answers. Okay, how about the answers? <laughs> well, the first two were 47. about the writing process. Oh, that was, I was answering a question I was hearing on my own head. <laughs> no. It was a math question. Of course it was. <laughs> well, the first two about the writing process. Mm -hmm. Um, how long does it take to write a story, and what is the hardest part about writing a story? Um, well, it's uh, kind of working backwards. The hardest part for me is figuring out what stories that are oral tradition stories will make a good book, because not all stories that I tell will, will translate to, to the page. And once I find a story that I really enjoy, like Clever Monkey or The Drum or How Tiger Got His Stripes, I'll tell the story probably I don't know, several dozen times and have really have it worked out on stage before I'll try to put it down on the paper. So it probably over the course of, you know, probably several weeks, uh, once I've decided about a new story, you know, I'll just find it, you know, revise it, you know, and get it polished on stage and figuring out how to put it 
um, down on print and also to make it um, a really good animated piece as well because that's what we do with all of the story coke books well, the next two questions were from your book the clever monkey okay and the boys wanted to know do monkeys really eat cheese and why do the two cats trust the monkey um, actually monkeys uh, is a very good question actually monkeys do eat cheese and these cats in this story they trust the monkey because they don't trust themselves and a lot of times in stories what you'll figure out is if you go with your best instinct you know it's always good to take care of your own needs instead of in, uh, trusting that to somebody else but in this case the cats were so distrustful of each other and distrustful of themselves they said no monkey here you divide the cheese you do a better job than we could do ourselves and um, it didn't go too well for them because they end up with no cheese at all. I don't know where that accent just came from. I just, oh, look, a trip to the Balkans. <laughs> oh, now we're back. <laughs> Do your stories always have a message? Um, yes. I think all stories have a message. Some of them are really profound messages, and some of them are, some of them could be simple as the message is, wow, that was a really fun story. But I think all stories, the reason that stories last, especially folk tales, have lasted for hundreds of years, is that there is, th like you said, there's a truth in there. Do, do cats really talk to each other like that? Not really, because kids will ask me sometimes, these stories, did they really happen? You know, did the monkey actually talk to the cat? Probably not, but is it truth that if you cannot work things out among yourselves that you end up losing a lot more than you gain? Yeah, that is true. There's a lot of truth in these. Let's take a few more email questions. Okay. Um, this question is from Lindsay and Caitlin at Johnsburg Elementary School in Pennsylvania. They want to know when and how did you get the idea of telling folk tales from different countries? And have you traveled to each of these countries? Okay, the easiest question to answer is the second one. And, and, and no, I haven't traveled <laughs> to any of these countries. <laughs> but, uh, but I just like the idea of connecting cultures and how people that can find so many common threads through the different, different cultures. Uh, yes, this is Mrs. Fallon's class in Fort St. Lucie, Florida. And my class was wanting to know what advice you can give the students about writing about one of their personal experiences and turning that into a book. Oh, that's a great question because storytelling does very much involve personal narratives, and I do a lot of work with schools and kids because there are so many, there's a lot of wisdom to be found in your own family stories as well. And I think you treat your personal stories just like you would treat a folk tale. It, there's a conflict, there's, there's a, obviously there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. It could be about the time that you brought the dog home and he wouldn't get housebroken. And hopefully there's a happy ending at the end of a story like that. But it really is, there's a conflict. I mean, every story has a problem to be solved and the story comes out of, you lead into the problem, how the main character, in this case, uh, the, the, the student or the student's family member and how it is resolved. For the teachers who are watching, how mm -hmm. does storytelling help with language art skills? Oh, storytelling is an amazing way for kids to become fluent with language. It's a, an amazing way for them to become fluent with stories. Uh, one of the things that we do with schools is that even though the Story Cove books are a lower reading level, that's only because of the number of words per the page and all that. They're really, the interest level goes up through middle school. And once kids have found a book that they really enjoy, and they'll read it over and over again, and then they can look at the animation and they have fun with it, then they become very fluent in the reading. And the words translate from one book to another, and all of a sudden we've got kids that can read Clever Monkey. Now they can read uh, The Wizard of Oz. Okay, that's a huge jump. But they, can, they read Clever Monkey, then they can read yeah, Wizard of Oz, why not? It's a big jump. Wizard of Oz has, it's a big book, but very small words, except for the quadlings. <laughs> quadlings were the characters in the book with the heads that shot out and hit with the, you're so young. <laughs> <laughs> Using Rob Cleveland's approach to storytelling, my students created their own original stories. I started off the tale, but each student went on to create their own stitch in the storyline. It's quite a yarn. In the African forest lived a lion who was so shy, he was afraid of his own shadow. This lion was weak, 
but he had a very strong card. So one day, the lion um, was with the other animals, and they decided to gang up on him, and they were making fun of him, and because he was so scared of them, he just ran away. One day, while leaping in a small and dark part of the forest, the lion stumbled upon a magic grill gnome in which he was wearing a red hat and green trousers. The gnome liked to cause trouble, so when the lion was crying, he said, Dear lion, I see that you are sad. Follow me to the Cave of Echoes, and there I will give you strength. When the lion went to the Cave of Echoes, or AKA the gnome's lair, the gnome said, I will give you a beautiful mane and a strong voice if you help me take over the forest. But then the lion says, I don't want to rule over anybody. I will never be able to hurt any animal's feelings or tell them what to do. The gnome thought. Then he said, why do you care about their feelings? They just make you cry. Then Lady Wisdom appeared and said to the lion, Do not let the gnome trick you. I will give you a beautiful mane and a strong voice if you use it wisely. The lion decided it was better to be kind and fair than to be strong and feared. So he listened to Lady Wisdom, and now his roar can be heard all over the jungle. And that is how the lion got its roar. So, what do you think? Oh, that's a great story. I love that. I love how it went and you made the cat's cradle and the, the web, but it was, it was, and it was really great how you could see the kids thinking and, and keeping that story, the storyline going, which is, uh, which is really, it's a lot, a lot of fun. And then there was a natural place where it just kind of, it ended. And I thought that was a, that was a really great activity. Well done, kids, with the, with the story yarn. You, you got a future. <laughs> you do. I'm not just saying that. Well, I am just saying that. I just <laughs> said it. But, but I'm not just saying it like in that sarcastic just saying it. <coughs> uh, be quiet now, Suzanne. You know <laughs> no, no. Go, 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 go. Well, tweet, what are tweet, some tweet, of the challenges tweet. that you face uh, moving from being a storyteller to actually writing a book? Um, kind of like we talked about, you know, just figuring out what stories, um, the stories that are, that are really good orally don't necessarily translate uh, to print. And, and doing that. It's kind of the biggest d decision, and there's so many great stories. It's also deciding, you know, I, I can't, we can't bring them all to print because printing actually costs its money. And so there, you know, so there are constraints there, but there are so many great stories. So I just have fun finding them and, and sharing them with kids all over the country <coughs> well, or the world. We're almost out of time. We all know. <laughs> no. Yes, it's almost over. It cannot be over. <laughs> It's like when Sonny and Cher broke up. <laughs> I don't know. Well, before we go. Before, yes. What advice would you <sighs> offer to aspiring storytellers and aspiring writers? Just um, read a lot and talk to, um, you know, talk to members of your family. Find out from your parents or your grandparents or neighbors what were their favorite stories when they were growing up or something that happened to them that they will always remember. And then that'll lead you to finding your own stories. And then you'll find some really great stories and wisdom from those people around you. Was that profound enough? That was very profound. Was it? Yes. Whew. <laughs> you know, a lot of pressure. You want to come up with something like really deep to <laughs> end on. It's like, and that is how you solve the world's problems. <laughs> and whew. Rob, thank you so much for thank joining you, us Suzanne. today. It was a very enjoyable interview. OK. Our guest is author and storyteller Rob Cleveland. If you would like to learn more about his books, visit his website at www.augusthouse.com. Visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Suzanne Tweet. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. <laughs>